Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Radon webinar. My name is Jill Hubick and I'm a registered nurse and certified respiratory educator with the Lung Association of Saskatchewan. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you across Canada to be your host and your moder moderator for tonight's webinar. As we gather here today, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Before we begin, on behalf of the Lung Association, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the healthcare providers and the champions in lung health. We truly appreciate their service to Canadian families and the above and beyond efforts they've undertaken during the pandemic. We're very pleased to be here today to share this webinar with you. The Lung Association has been able to lead radon initiatives, including tonight's webinar, with the help of Health Canada. We are grateful for their support and continued partnership. Please note that the presentation is in English only. The slide deck provided by Health Canada will be available in French after the webinar on myradonstory.ca. All right, so just a few housekeeping items before we begin. If you're joining us by phone, please note that your lines will be muted during the session and we ask that you uh, type any questions into the chat feature uh, of the webinar software. Please address all questions to the organizers and panelists. We will facilitate the question and answer period following the presentation. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our amazing speakers for tonight, Carrie Tucker, is a young mother of three who survived lung cancer attributed to radon exposure. Since her diagnosis, Carrie has become an ambassador for the Lung Association with the goal to increase radon awareness and education. She continues to courageously share her story and to empower people across the country to test for and reduce radon levels in their homes. Kelly Bush is the manager of Health Canada's National Radon Education and Awareness Program. Her role with Health Canada started out as an interesting job as a public servant doing something that could help improve the health of Canadians and quickly became something more. As she spoke with more and more Canadians about how radon has impacted their lives, her job became a passion, a hope, a conviction that together we can make a difference. Kelly works with stakeholders to help people see, hear, and take action to reduce the incidence of radon-related lung cancer across the country. The Lung Association is grateful for her expertise, her partnership, and her commitment to lung health. So both Carrie and Kelly are featured in the Lung Association's radon um, current campaign. I'm just going to try here and advance my slides. There we go. Uh, our current campaign is called MyRadonStory.ca and the campaign features stories with lung cancer survivors like Carrie as well as lung specialists, radon mitigation experts, public health experts and scientists. Their journeys are all very different but they have together united with the same message. Test your home for radon and if radon levels are high Work with a certified radon reduction professional to lower your radon levels to protect your family. We hope that you'll visit myradonstory.ca to read all of their powerful stories. So it's now my honor to introduce and welcome Carrie Tucker to share her story with all of us. Thank you, Jill. Um, it's awesome to see so many people um, interested in learning more about radon. Um, my education with radon started a couple of years ago with Jill, actually. Um, Jill presented at um, my real estate board. We had an education day and uh, I was there um, to learn. And I, had, I knew very little, admittedly, about radon at the time um, and became interested in it and actually did some information for some of my clients um, through social media and shared some information but had no idea how it was about to impact my life. Um, so in June of, of 2019 I developed pneumonia and uh, of course I had to have a x-ray and they found a spot on my lung that they believed was 
um, infection. And so I had antibiotics and then um, was really not getting better. So I went back to the doctor and had another x-ray which um, showed it hadn't changed. And so um, I was sent for a CT scan. Once my family doctor got my CT scan, um, she became pretty concerned and, and referred me to a lung specialist who phoned me and um, said, you know, I can't get you into my office until the end of the month. This is really concerning. Do you have any history of lung cancer in your family? And I, I never thought someone was gonna be asking me this question. I, I didn't have any history of lung cancer in my family and I had never smoked. And so I was just shocked of, that I was being asked this. Um, Anyway, he, he said that he wanted to do a PET scan. So I went for the PET scan and unfortunately the spot did light up in the scan, which is a pretty good indication of cancer. And um, so I was referred to a surgeon then for um, a biopsy. So I had a biopsy, which is a terrible experience. I don't wish that on anybody. Um, and um, unfortunately, a few days later, got the results that it was, um, it did show that there was some cancer in that spot. So at that time, I was diagnosed with stage one, and they believed it was just in that one spot, and I was um, sent or told that I would be having a surgery. And so with a lung, the surgery to, to remove cancers, they don't just take out bits and pieces, they take out a full lobe. So um, my right lung had the lower lobe completely removed in that surgery and um, they did take some lymph nodes from the area at the time and then I just had to recover from that and then wait for the results of the testing on that tissue and get another call more bad news that um, there was cancer in the lymph nodes that they took out and so I was referred to an oncologist at the cancer center and then told the next step would be chemotherapy. So in that time I met with, I went into the Lung Association, I wanted to get a test kit for my house because I had still had never tested my house. And Jill happened to be there and we got talking and um, I really started to, I wanted to share it. So I did start sharing information on, through social media and to my clients um, and with a colleague of mine, we did some, a lot of um, information sharing about it. Um, and then with Jill and Jen and every all these awesome people at the Lung Association, we decided to start a campaign and the other My Radon story uh, was formed. We did a very awesome video where my family got involved, my parents, my kids, my sister. Um, the video is very powerful and I encourage anyone, if you haven't watched it, to watch it. Um, I will warn you, my dad will probably make you cry <laughs> if you watch it. Um, but it was a really good video. And once that campaign launched, um, it's my understanding that the Lung Association was selling kits like crazy and people were really listening to the story and testing their homes and um, that was great. Um, I wanted to continue that. I had to stop for a bit because I had to go and do the chemotherapy, which I did and was given, I had the last one at the end of February last year and was given my all clear in March of 2020, just in time for COVID to hit, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. So spent more time at home. Um, in the meantime, you know, Lots of my family and friends, everybody was becoming very interested in the story and sharing it, uh, including my cousin, Jenea, and her husband, Dean. Um, and, you know, we got talking about it. And I really just, I knew there was something more that I could do about this and really wanted to be more involved. And so Dean and I uh, met and talked and we decided to join forces and team up as business partners. And we opened a certified radon mitigation company called River City Radon here in Saskatoon. So today I am cancer free and I am back to real estate and operating River City Radon with Dean and um, still very much interested in encouraging people to test your home and reduce the levels in your home if you need to. Um, it's an important step for your family. And um, I just, I just, I can't, I don't shut up about it. So anybody who knows me knows <laughs> I'm a great on girl. And uh, I just want people to test your home, know your number, mitigate if you need to, and prevent a future lung cancer diagnosis and not have to go through what I did. 
Thank you, Carrie. Um, you know, I think so many people around the country can relate to you. you. You're just, you know, that normal, typical Canadian girl, and it just shows that, you know, this can happen to anyone. Um, it's shocking when it does, um, but, you know, you have really inspired all of us and, and taken a horrific situation and turned it into an opportunity, uh, you know, to prevent this from happening to so many other people. So we commend you and we're so grateful for you as our Breathe Ambassador and for all that you've done. And we're excited um, to continue to spread awareness about Radon. So thank you. And thank you for being here tonight, sharing your story. I know that's, that's not easy. It takes a lot of courage. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I'm excited as well uh, to move on to the next part of our presentation tonight and welcome our keynote speaker from Health Canada. Please welcome Kelly Bush. Thank you very much, Jill and Carrie. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to start my presentation. Oh, I got to show my screen first. Bear with me for a second. Okay. So. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to participate in this presentation on Radon. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about what Radon is, how it affects your health, and what you can do to reduce your exposure and risk from Radon gas. I'm also going to provide you with an overview of Health Canada's National Radon Program and the, the priorities, research, and projects that we're currently focused on. So what is Radon? Well, radon is a radioactive gas that is produced by the breakdown of uranium in soil and rock in the ground. Radon represents almost 50% of a person's lifetime radiation exposure. Radon is a class one human carcinogen, according to the International Agency for Research on Cancer. All homes have some level of radon, unless you live in a tree house or a boathouse. Any house in contact with the ground will have some level of radon. But the question will always be, how much? And the only way to know is to test. And you're going to hear me repeat that a couple times in the next 20 minutes. If the radon level in your home is high, it can be fixed. And the Canadian guideline for radon in indoor air, in indoor air is 200 becquerels per cubic meter. So I said it earlier, I'm going to say it again. All homes and buildings in contact with the ground will have some radon in them. And that's because radon is a gas and it can move easily from the ground into our homes through any small opening it can find, such as cracks and gaps in the home's foundation floor, around pipes, and in the floor wall joint. You can see in the animation on the slide all of the different ways that radon can enter a building. And another thing that influences the amount of radon that is in a home is the difference in the air pressure in the home versus in the ground underneath the home. This difference in air pressure creates a vacuum effect that draws soil gas and radon into the building. What you see on the screen is a radon risk map of Canada. This map was developed using the radon data from Health Canada's Cross Canada residential surveys completed over the last 10 years. We estimate that approximately 7% of homes in Canada have high radon in them. This percentage varies significantly across the country with some areas estimated to have as much as 50% of homes with high radon. Whether you live in an area with lower high radon, or if you know your neighbor tested and found lower high radon, you cannot predict or know what the radon level is in your own home. The only way to know is to do a test. As you can see on this map, there are no areas of Canada that are radon free. Um, the red to pink color scheme of this map was chosen on purpose specifically to communicate that there is risk in all parts of Canada and this supports Health Canada's recommendation that all homes and buildings should be tested and then mitigated if high levels are found. The health risk from radon is long term and depends on three things. How high the radon level is, how long you're exposed to it, and whether or not you're a smoker. Radon is the number one cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. Health Canada estimates that more than 3,000 lung cancer deaths a year are radon-induced. When you breathe radon in, it gets into the lining of your lungs, 
The radon particles release radioactive energy bursts that can damage the cells in your lungs. Over time, the damaged cells can lead to the development of lung cancer. Smokers and previous smokers also exposed to high radon levels have a significantly increased risk of developing lung cancer. So despite everything I've just told you about radon and its significant health impact, it's really challenging to get people to pay attention to this issue. Many have not heard of it, or if they have, they don't believe it's a risk for them. Most people who don't smoke really just don't worry about lung cancer. The risk of lung cancer from radon gas exposure is significant, but preventable. If you take the actions needed, first test and then reduce if the levels are high. To help people better understand the risk from radon, we developed the risk comparison chart. The chart on the slide compares the risk of dying of radon-induced lung cancer to other better known risks that people think about more often, such as car accidents, carbon monoxide, and house fires. The risk of dying from radon is higher than all accidental deaths combined. And accidental deaths include car accidents, fires, drownings, poisonings. So the message is, if you change the batteries in your smoke detectors, if you put your seatbelt on when you get in a car, if you wear a life jacket or you put a life jacket on your children when you go on a boat, why would you not test for radon and reduce it if the levels are high? So I've mentioned a couple times that the only way to know is to test. So how do you do the test? It's actually quite simple. You have two options. You purchase a do-it-yourself test kit or you hire a certified professional. Um, measurement professional. We recognize in Canada the Canadian National Radon Proficiency Program, or CNRPP, and you can see their logo in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. Whatever option you choose, you need to do a long-term test for a minimum of three months, ideally during the fall or winter time when your windows and doors are mostly closed. To find a certified radon test kit or measurement professional, you can go to takeactiononradon.ca. So long-term testing is really important because radon levels can vary significantly over time. The Canadian guideline for uh, le guideline level of 200 becquerels per meter cubed is an annual average exposure level. So to be able to estimate the annual average exposure level in your home, you need to test for a minimum of three months. There are short-term tests available on the market, but we don't recommend them. As you can see from the image on the slide, radon levels vary significantly. Doing a short-term test for a couple of days can lead to a false positive or a false negative result. So what you see on this slide is a new fact sheet, that we, fact sheet that we've developed to provide Canadians with detailed guidance on radon testing. So I've said a couple times radon testing is easy. It is, but there are a number of steps. So we wanted to make sure that Canadians had the information they needed to, to, to make sure they complete those tests if you're doing a do-it-yourself. Uh, and you've purchased a test kit. So this fact sheet will help you choose the best place to, pl to put your detector and remind you of the steps you should follow to properly complete the test and send the detector back to the lab for analysis. If you completed the long-term test in your home and the radon level is above the Canadian guideline of 200 becquerels per cubic meter, Health Canada recommends that you take action to lower the level. The higher the radon concentration, the sooner action should be taken to reduce them. The image that you see on the screen shows you the timeframes that we recommend for radon mitigation. You should reduce the radon level within two years if your levels are below 600 and within one if they're above 600. These timeframes allow you the time you need to seek quotes from certified professionals and work out budgeting for the mitigation. If your radon level is high, reduce it. Reducing the amount of radon in your home is, is easy. Techniques to lower radon levels are effective and can save lives. Radon levels in most homes can be reduced by more than 80% and can typically be done and installed or the system installed in less than a day. The most effective radon reduction method is called active soil depressurization. This method involves installing a pipe through the foundation floor that leads outside of the house, either at ground level or roof line with a fan attached. And you can see both of those options, ground level and roof line um, 
depicted in the image in the slide. The system draws the radon from below the house and exhausts it outside before it can enter your home. Installation of an active soil depressurization system by a CNRPP certified professional typically costs between two and $4,000. Health Canada has developed a radon reduction guide for Canadians that provides information and guidance on what you can and should do if you have high levels of radon in your home. The Government of Canada really strives to provide Canadians with evidence-based guidance and information. So what you're seeing on this slide is the results of our radon mitigation survey that we did. And we did this as a follow-up to our cross-Canada residential measurement surveys. We contacted participants of the cross-Canada surveys who had high radon levels, and we asked them if they took any action. And if they did, we collected information about what they did and offered them a follow-up test. This allowed us to get a better understanding of how effective different radon reduction actions are. So the results of the survey are on, this, on the slide, and they provide a clear evidence and confirm that the guidance that we provide to Canadians to hire a certified mitigation professional to reduce the radon level in your home is the most effective solution and can significantly reduce radon levels. Some people also uh, increased home ventilation. And what that means typically is either you were already planning to install a new air exchanger or heat uh, recovery ventilator, um, or you had one and you weren't using it. Um, and in that case, then you should uh, first try that. Um, it can reduce radon levels, but not as effectively as the active soil depressurization system. So what we saw was about a 25 to 50% decrease. Um, and it confirmed uh, what we already suspected, which is uh, sealing cracks uh, and the ways that entry, radon is entering into the home. It really isn't an, an effective standalone solution. Um, when you hire a certified professional to install a radon mitigation system, sealing cracks that are visual that they can see is part of uh, the work that they typically do. So now I'm going to spend a little time to tell you about Health Canada's National Radon Program. The National Radon Program was established in 2008 and consists of five main components. Number one, character, uh, characterizing the extent of the radon problem in Canada through measurement and mapping. Number two, technical projects to develop and validate guidance and technologies for radon risk reduction and to transfer that knowledge to relevant stakeholders and in industry. Number three, to research, uh, to do research to better understand how radon leads to lung cancer. Four, encouraging adoption of radon risk management practices in relevant policy and legislation. And five, delivery of a radon education and public awareness strategy to inform Canadians on radon risks and encourage action to reduce those risks, which I'm responsible for. Not reducing the risk, the uh, radon outreach camp, uh, program. Um, when we started the National Radon Program, we wanted to really lead by example and walk the talk. So we were telling Canadians that all homes should be tested. And so what we did was we launched, uh, initially one of the first things we did is launch a federal building testing program, inviting federal government departments to test their buildings. Through this program, more than 20,000 buildings were tested. As I mentioned earlier, when I showed you this slide on the map, we also conducted two large scale cross Canada residential radon surveys. This was done to get a better understanding of radon levels across the country. More than 18,000 homes were tested and we estimate 7% of homes in Canada, approximately 7% of homes in Canada have high radon level. Other national radon program highlights from the past decade include uh, changes to the 2010 National Building Code to reduce radon infil infiltration and facilitate the installation of radon reduction systems if needed. We continue to work with relevant authorities and the building industry to encourage more action and changes to future building codes as well. We've completed radon research in testing and mitigation techniques granite and building materials to provide evidence-based policy and public guidance. And um, we worked uh, to have uh, the development of national standards for radon in new and existing construction with the Canadian General Standards Boards. And then of course, the delivery of an extensive uh, radon education and awareness program across the country in collaboration with credible partners. Um, a great example is tonight's presentation, host, uh, presentation hosted by the Saskatchewan Lung Association. 
So key to the radon outreach and education efforts under the National Radon Program has been the development, trial, and expansion of many different targeted programs. Over the last 10 years, we've tried many different approaches to raise awareness and pilot projects across the country. Some were effective, and over time we expanded them. Others were not, and we stopped doing them. What you see on this screen um, are some of the targeted projects and programs that had the most significant impact in not only raising awareness, but really motivating action. So examples of that are working with public health authorities, educating health professionals, collaboration with real estate and childcare associations, collaboration with energy efficiency audit programs, supporting radon testing through library lending programs, and promoting community radon testing programs. At the end of the day, what's critical to raising awareness and most importantly influencing radon reduction action is the development of more grassroots efforts getting all of the relevant jurisdictional authorities raising their voice on radon. What you see on the screen now are examples of radon action and policy change that happened at the provincial, territorial, municipal level or, or are happening. Um, so some examples of those are adding radon reduction to public health standards um, and uh, that happened in Ontario, including radon mitigation in new home warranty programs, um, also in Ontario, more stringent building codes to reduce radon in high-risk areas. And we've seen this happen in a number of areas and what you, on the screen you can see in uh, British Columbia and then also at the municipal level. So we used uh, Guelph as an example there, uh, including radon mitigation in home renovation tax credit programs. So this is fairly new and, and an exciting progress in Saskatchewan. Um, Mandatory school and daycare testing is happening in a number of areas across company, uh, across company, across Canada. Pro proclamations of November is Radon Action Month, and much more. These policies and grassroots actions are making a difference, getting more people to pay attention to the issue of radon and take action. One of the current National Radon Program priorities is the development of radon action guides for provinces and territories and municipalities. Um, to help them develop radon action plans more easily. We are also working on research to support more changes to the building codes. Um, we're doing research on radon health economic analysis to support policy and regulatory change. And we're doing some radon behavior research to find better and more effective ways to get Canadians to take action. So, I've shared with you quite a bit of information over the last 15 to 20 minutes about radon and about what Health Canada is doing related to radon. Here's the most important things I want you to remember. Radon is a radioactive gas that comes from uranium in the ground. All homes have some level in them. The only way to know how much is to test. Long-term exposure to radon is the number one cause of lung cancer for non-smokers a serious but preventable health risk. Testing is easy. Purchase a, a do-it-yourself test kit or hire a certified measurement professional. Do a three-month test in the fall or winter time, and if the level is high, reduce it. You can reduce the radon level in your home. Hire a certified mitigation professional. And if, if you have questions or you need information, contact Health Canada. We have the answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your your wonderful presentation. Um, you gave us a great Radon 101, uh, a great overview of what's going on across the country. And we just really admire your knowledge and expertise and experience, and also just your dedication and passion to Radon and Lung Health. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that with us. Uh, we're pleasure. going to move. We're going to move now into the question and answer uh, period of okay. the presentation. So I'll remind everyone that if you have questions, just put your questions in the chat feature and, and we'll be happy uh, to try and answer them for you. Uh, and, and that should be located, um, you should be able to see right in your software there, uh, chat. 
and, and make sure that your questions are sent to the organizers and the panelists, and we'll be able to see them there. Okay, so we have a few questions uh, for you, Kelly and Carrie. So I'm my first question here um, is, uh, they had said, you know, you had mentioned that unless you live on a boat or in a tree house, <laughs> you should test yeah. for radon. Um, and but what about people that live in apartment buildings and, and can you mm -hmm. can you speak to that a little bit? Yep, sure. Um, a great question. Uh, so as a part of that, I mentioned we did a federal building testing um, program. And uh, as a part of that program, we did evaluate the potential for radon to be at higher levels in a multi story building. Um, and uh, through that program, what we what we found was that anything above the second story typically will be low. So when it, someone comes to me and they're in a condo or uh, an apartment building, uh, I will typically say if you're in the second story or below, then you should test. Okay. Okay. And when there's multiple units, would every single individual unit need to test? Yeah, that gets a little more complicated. It depends on the building and their ventilation system, right? So if I know in a lot of, in for con condos, we've had someone contact us recently. Um, condos typically have their their own ventilation system, so yes, in that case, they should individually be tested. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so there was one question here um, after Carrie's presentation. They were really intrigued and would like to uh, see Carrie's video that she talked to you and uh, they want to know where they can see your video Carrie. Oh I believe it's still on the myradonstory.ca website. It sure is yeah so if you go to that um, myradonstory.ca you can definitely uh, see Carrie's Carrie's amazing video um, and, and yes her dad might make you cry. <laughs> um, okay so another question here um, this one's for Kelly. Kelly, can you talk a little bit more about digital radon detectors? You talked about not really recommending a short-term test, but there's a lot of digital detectors out there on Amazon and, and whatnot, and are those okay to use? Yeah, yeah, we get that question a lot. So um, Health Canada recommends approved uh, test kits and detectors in laboratories. Um, those you will find uh, at takeactiononradon.ca or um, uh, through the CNRPP website. Um, the digital detectors have not been evaluated, so we can't recommend them because they have not been evaluated and approved. That doesn't mean that they don't work and they're not, the results aren't valid. Um, and I completely understand why people want to use them because the test kits, the do-it-yourself test kits, there's no screen. You can't see your results until three months is up, you send it to the lab, and then you get the results back. Um, but if you called us with a result from a digital detector, we'd probably recommend that you also do um, use it an approved long-term test kit just to validate the results until those digital detectors can be properly evaluated, which the, they are working on on doing that evaluation process. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. That's that's great and exciting work that's coming. And, you know, yeah. I certainly see, see uh, more and more information as we learn more. So thank you for that answering that question so well, because uh, there's a lot out there, so it's hard to know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, we've got a few questions. So for people that want to purchase a, a long-term radon test kit, where can they do that again? Kelly, where's a, a great reliable source? Well, takeactiononradon.ca will have a, a bunch of different sources for Canadians across the country. And um, uh, of course, given that you're hosting it, so the, uh, the Saskatchewan Lung Association has test kits available as well. Um, and many of the provincial lung associations do, but they are also listed at the takeactiononradon.ca website. That's right. Yeah. And, and we, you just want to make sure that you have a long-term approved Health Canada kit, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and it's not Health Canada. This is a, the thing that gets a little confusing. So it's not Health Canada that approves them, but it is the Canadian National Radon Proficiency Program who works with us and aligns with what our guidance is. Very good. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that clarification. All right, so we have people that haven't tested their home yet for mm -hmm. radon, but because it's February, March, we're getting into spring, it's recommended to test in the winter months. Is it okay to start testing now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I say to anyone who wants to start, and it's not ideally in the fall or winter time frame to start, um, it depends on where you live in Canada. If, for most of the three months, your windows and doors are pretty closed. So you're not ventilate, you know, there's not extra ventilation in the home, then you could 
then you could do the three months and that's it. Um, the test kits that you pur that purchase or the measurement, if you were to hire someone, um, typically they, the, you can do a three month all the way to 12 months. So if you start it in the summer, then let it go for six months and, and capture some of that time when your windows and doors are closed. That's what we recommend. But if you don't, if you don't start it when you're thinking about it, it just gets shelved and you forget about it because something else just takes over. So I would never discourage someone from starting the test, but maybe going a little bit longer to, to make sure that, um, that you are uh, testing during a time where the house is more closed up. Because the reality in Canada is we live in, uh, you know, it's only a couple months of the year that we have doors and windows open a lot. That's right. That's right. And every day is a great day to test. So yeah, yep. awesome. Uh, this question is for Carrie. Um, were any other members of your family diagnosed with lung cancer? And what symptoms specifically did you experience? Hmm. Uh, no one else in my family has been diagnosed. Um, uh, I didn't really have symptoms. I did have one symptom. I had a bit of a cough and um, it was it would, had gotten a little bit worse and, but I have allergies and stuff. So my doctor was just thinking, you know, up your seasonal, take your seasonal allergy medicine every day instead. And, and actually after Jill um, presented at our education day, um, my colleague Tara and I were doing a little informational video for clients and we talked about radon. And after we were done, I jokingly <laughs> said to Tara or asked her, I said, maybe this is why I'm coughing all the time. And it was, you know, eight months later that I got pneumonia. And thankfully I did because lung cancer is caught usually at a much later stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we definitely see a lot of people that are diagnosed so late because that's when their symptoms show mm -hmm. up. So and I, I would have never I thought to be grateful that. for pneumonia. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Carrie. Okay, so um, one of the questions here is is asking um, Kelly, since the the start of your radon um, programs that were launched in 2008, have you then seen a decline in radon-induced lung cancer since then, since the awareness of testing and mitigation has gone up? So um, at this stage of the program, we're not um, yet measuring a reduction in um, radon induced lung cancer. And, and the reality, the, what we would look at doing is larger scale um, measurement studies again to see if we're finding lower levels of radon. And that would relate to um, the changes to building codes and construction and those types of things. Um, but it will take a lot longer to be able to do effective epidemiological type studies to determine um, the impact on uh, lung cancer rates, especially because you never get lung cancer because of one thing, right? It's, there's genetics, there's smoking, absolutely. Um, there's other environmental impacts, uh, but we just, we know that smoking significantly and radon are very big contributors to yeah. uh, development of lung cancer, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Kelly. And Kelly, our, like carbon monoxide, when we have high levels of carbon monoxide, we know because there's symptoms right away. Are there mm. early signs when your radon levels are really high? No, no, unfortunately not. And similar to you know what Carrie was saying, Carrie was saying there are no there are no symptoms to to lung cancer in general. And it really is, as far as any of the research that's available today, the only health risk related to um, radon is um, lung cancer. And We've had questions like things like, uh, you know, um, asthma or respiratory issues. And I want to make it clear that and I described briefly early, earlier how radon um, uh, impacts your lung and how it leads to lung cancer. It really is um, a, a damage, a DNA damage to the cells in your lung tissue. So it's not affecting your respiratory um, um, issue, uh, respiratory um your respiration. It really is, it's cell damage that leads to lung cancer. So unfortunately there are no symptoms. Thank, thanks. And that, and I guess that's what makes it, like you said, 
um, hard to convince Canadians to test, yeah. right? It's, it's out of sight, out of mind. You can't see, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, and there's no symptoms. If we were all starting to feel sick, if we had high levels, we'd probably do something right. about it sooner, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that is long term, right? It's not immediate. Like carbon monoxide, you can't see it, smell it, or taste it either, but you know if you have it, it's going to be an immediate problem. That's and right. And you hear those stories, and it's scary, but most people don't think they're going to get lung cancer. So it's very hard to convince them to do something today that'll stop something 10, 20 years from now. It's a challenge. But it, the one thing I can, I can tell you, and I'm sure, Jilly, you can say the same thing, and I'm sure, Carrie, you would say it, um, is I get calls from people who have lung cancer who had never smoked or stopped smoking a long time ago, and they always say the same thing. I wish I had known or I wish I had tested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, there's there's this misconception of who always develops lung cancer and mm -hmm. and yeah, no one thinks it's going to happen to them. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for that that great answer. Uh, this one can be for either Carrie or Kelly. I know you both are very knowledgeable in the mitigation world. Um, people are wondering. Some people have wood floors as well as crawl spaces that show. Um, dirt, exposed dirt, does that make you more likely to have high radon levels if it, your home isn't sealed up like with a concrete foundation? Carrie, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm happy to provide an answer. We both can if you want to start or? Go ahead. Oh, you okay. Can. Um, it depends on the, what's underneath that house, right? Um, yeah. If there's, if there's um, a high potential of radon exposure underneath that house, then yes, having those types of floors can make it more um, susceptible to be permeating into your home. It still can be mitigated though. Yes, yeah, I think that's the most important message that you don't need a um, a concrete uh, foundation to put the pipe into. Um, I will say our research has shown that in some cases with crawl spaces or like open um, dirt floors, they're really compacted. So it's not necessarily guaranteed that that means you're gonna have that much more radon. Right, so that I will say that, and I say that because some people it, it's a deterrent to testing. Oh my, you know, oh no, I have a crawl space with ground floor. I'm going to find high levels. I don't want to do it. There's lots of homes with with those types of basements or those types of um, crawl spaces that have low levels of radon, but you won't know until you test. Yeah, great answers, both of you. Thank you for that. Okay, so so this is this is a great question. If seat belts are mandatory and they save lives, how come radon testing isn't mandatory? Yeah, that's a tough one. Well, we the government can't mandate um, you to do things in your home for the most part. Um, your home is your own space. We can recommend, there's guidance there. I mean, even if you think about carbon monoxide detectors, it's in the building code now. It's a requirement to add them, but it's not a requirement um, to and to meet certain qualifications. But at this point in time, the guideline is not enforceable. And I, I no, and I don't know, I, we'd love to see a requirement for testing at the building code level, but that's something that's gonna, that would be out in the, into the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Thank you for, that was a, um, a great question. Thank you. Okay, so another great question. Um, what happens if you're in the process of either selling or buying your home? Are radon test results, should they be disclosed for one? And then two, if you're trying to buy a home and they haven't tested for radon, what can you do with your realtor? I'm guessing, well, Carrie, you might sure. want to take this one. <laughs> um, I know there are some some areas in the country where people do add um, like a three or four day test to a real estate transaction, similar to adding a home inspection as a condition. So we may see that happen here eventually. It's a little bit hard um, to get an uptake with with realtors to do that because it's one more thing for a client to worry about. Where what we're trying to do here is to in, um, educate realtors as much as possible and encourage their buyers to test their home after they move in. So give them a test kit, as, you know, as part of their closing gift or something like that. Um, as far as it being a part of a disclosure, I'm not sure across Canada if that's anywhere in um, as, as a rule, but it's not in our disclosure statement currently. Um, 
it is something you can ask if somebody has tested their home, but it's also personal and private information. So um, what I would like to see is people test their home and mitigate if it's high prior to listing it. And then you can have that as a feature that you have taken care of this and this is a, you know, healthy home you're moving into. Yeah. Totally Kelly, agree. anything How else you want to add? Just that, I mean, a three month test, which is what we recommend, doesn't fit into a real estate transaction timeframe. Um, so we recommend you test before or after. And actually on one of the slides that I showed, we do have a radon in real estate um, pamphlet. And that is essentially what we recommend, test before or test after. Uh, if there's an insistence on testing, some uh, parts of the country, what they'll do is they'll do a whole back clause. It doesn't work in all parts of the country um, and, and all real estate uh, transaction situations, but you can do a, a whole back clause where you can do a three month test. And if the radon levels are found to be high, then money can be provided for the mitigation system. But never, like I always say to people who call and say, well, I don't know if I should buy this house because, you know, because of, the, you know, the area is known to be high in radon. If it's your dream home, buy it. Every home has radon, you can fix it. Yeah, yeah. And I would just add to that that it's like anything. You could you can buy a house and two days after you move in, the water heater goes or the furnace cranks out. Yeah. So it's just something as a homeowner, you know that you have expenses. And if you're going to move into a property, just plan to test for it once you move in. And, and I mean, you have to plan for expenses on a house. And so that would just be something to add to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 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 we're starting to move certainly in these directions, and I believe in uh, just recently, um, BC became the first province to include radon testing in the disclosure statement, and 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 certainly we're learning from from the U.S. I think that in lots of places that um, that have this as part of um, their disclosure statements, and and so we're moving that direction. We'll get mm -hmm. there. Okay, um, uh, the next question um, is how often, um, Kelly, should one retest? So I've tested for radon, I've got my results, um, they're, they're good, they're, they're quite low. When do I do this again or, or is, do I just do it once? Am I good to go after once? Yeah, yeah, so currently our guidance is that you, in a home, you only need to test, you test once and unless you significantly structurally change the home where let's say you do an addition or something that would create an opportunity for more radon to get into the home, you don't need to test again. If you test, find high levels and mitigate, then we recommend that you retest after two years and then every five years after that, just to make sure the mitigation system is uh, continuing to function properly. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so then another question is, is it different if you have a new home versus an older home? Are you more at risk of mm -hmm. having higher or lower levels of radon? Does that matter? So I can tell you with the Cross Canada surveys um, that we did, we collected a lot of information about the homes, uh, the, the year it was built, the, the type of build, the foundation, ventilation system, et cetera. You, uh, and we found no correlation between uh, radon results and any of those things. It would make our job a lot easier if we could say, if you have this type of house, this age, this year. Um, that being said, uh, more recently, there is some research coming out that is um, indicating that homes built to be energy efficient that are more sealed up are more likely potentially to have high radon levels, especially if they're not ventilated well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then the next um, question that I have here um, is how much on average is a radon test kit to purchase and, and Kelly, how much on average is it usually if you have to mitigate your home with a certified radon reduction expert? So testing, typically if you buy a do-it-yourself test kit is somewhere in the range of 30 to $60 or so. Um, and mitigation, uh, so now there is, again, I mentioned how important for us it is that it's evidence-based, and I did mention it's typically two to $4,000. Um, as a part of the Take Action on Radon campaign, there is a mitigation sweepstakes. Uh, and through that process of applying for the mitigation sweepstakes, where you could get some money towards a certified mitigation that you've installed in your home, a lot of people have shared the data about their radon mitigation. So when they apply, they shared data about what their radon levels were before and after. And 
and how much they spent. And so now we know we've always, you know, evidence based that that two to four thousand dollar range is is definitely um, the range that we are seeing with the data that we're collecting through this program as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, and you know, I, I can speak a little bit to what the Lung Association offers for test kits. Our test kits are $65 plus tax, but it includes shipping um, both uh, ways so yeah. and, and the lab analysis. And we're really lucky to have a local Canadian accredited lab uh, that does their testing here right in Saskatchewan with the Saskatchewan Research Council. So you want to look into that too when you're purchasing a radon test kit. Does this include shipping? Does it include the analysis? Who's doing the analysis? All that good stuff. Um, uh, and then again, uh, making sure that it's a long-term radon test kit. So awesome. Okay, um, what about um, radon in water? Can radon be in well water? Um, and if so, do you test? How do you test? Yeah. That's yes. a question for Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, radon can be in well water only, so not in city water or municipal water supplies. Um, the risk from radon in water is uh, is inhalation only, not consumption. Uh, and it, it really what it is, is it contributes to the radon level in the air. So when your water is aerated through agitation, when you're running your shower or doing the laundry, um, it can contribute to the radon level in the air. You still test the same way. You would test the, the, the radon level in the air and typically you would mitigate the same way as well. And there are some cases where radon is the bigger contributor. So radon in the ground, coming from the ground into your home is almost always going to be the biggest contributor. And so you want to test the air and that's the, the mitigation approach you want to take. In some rare cases, radon in water is a bigger contributor. And then there are methods to, um, to remove that radon from the water before it gets into the home. Wonderful. But I tend to emphasize the test your house, test the air. People are yeah. sensitive and worry about their water and then they want to focus on the water. And it's really such a small contributor to um, the radon issue. Okay, okay. What about pets? Are they at risk of developing lung cancer from radon if they're breathing in the same air that we are and they're close to the ground? So I'm, we don't have any research on that. Um, I am, and I'm also not a, a medical expert with related to uh, animals and development of uh, cancer and lung cancer, um, but I have um, heard stories from um, Canadians who've contacted us about um, not only family members getting lung cancer, but pets getting cancer as a result of what they believe to be the, the radon exposure. So it's not out of the realm of possibility, certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, and Kelly, can you repeat what the website is um, where people can find a certified radon reduction expert in their area? Yeah, so it's uh, cnrpp.ca. And then on, on that website, there's a, a find a professional bu bu uh, button. And then you can search by, for measurement or mitigation professional by your postal code or by different sort of uh, geographical breakdowns. Thank you. Okay, and this question is also for Kelly. Kelly, can you explain a little bit more about what a Becquerel is? Uh, for example, this individual, just to understand the, the readings, I think a little bit more, uh, their basement be bedroom showed a reading of 50 Becquerels. And what does that mean? Does that mean it's safe to sleep in the basement? So I have to go back and look at the definition, but the a becquerel is a, a, a becquerel relates to the disintegration of uh, radiation um, over a certain time frame. Um, Fifty becquerels per cubic meter is quite low. Even it, I said um, radon comes from the ground, so it doesn't just seep into homes; it, it escapes outside as well. And you can measure. Um, radon gas and outdoor air, and the, typically the radon gas and outdoor air can be anywhere from 10 to 45, I think, if I recall correctly, becquerels per cubic meter. So 50 is quite low. My, I tested my house and my basement, and it was 89, and I'm very comfortable with that number. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you explain, Kelly, why there's a difference in guideline 
um, between Canada and the World Health Organization. Yeah. Um, so Health Canada set our guideline in 2008, in 2009, and at the time um, when we set that guideline, we looked internationally at what the guidelines were and also what the guidance was um, and what was uh, reasonable to set uh, and achievable because we need to balance health risk and um, what we're asking Canadians to do with regards to taking action and mitigating and reducing rate on levels. In 2009, the World Health Organization came out with their recommendation um, for 100. And it's actually, if you look into it, the recommendation is 100 to 300 becquerels as a guideline or reference level. Um, and, uh, it, and they said if there's existing, if you're an existing program and you're in that range, then and then that is a good range to be in. We continue to consider and look at our guideline level and work with our federal and provincial uh, territorial uh, radiation protection committee. But at this time, we have not decided to change it. We're going to stay with 200 because it's. We also communicate that there is no safe level of radon. And so it's not like you're at 199 and you're good and you don't have to do anything. It is a guideline. The risk below 200 is lower, but it's ultimately up to in each individual. And I'm sure um, well, Carrie and other mitigation professionals, I've heard stories of people that test at 150 did decide to, to mitigate anyways. And that's your, your personal choice. Okay, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Um, uh, Kelly, can you describe where the best place to test uh, uh, to test is in your home? Yes. So um, the lowest, what we say is the lowest lived in level of your home. Um, so if you have a basement, for example, and you spend time down there, we say minimum of four hours a day. But if you have a basement and you're not spending four hours a day, but you know you're going to renovate and add a bedroom or a playroom for your kids eventually, then you should still test in the basement. Um, but if it's a crawl space or storage area, you shouldn't test there because the risk for, from radon is the air that you're breathing. So you want to test where you're spending a decent or a significant amount of time. Um, and so you're breathing that air in. Great. Thank you. And I think we have time for just this last question here for Kelly. Uh, is the federal government looking at providing tax deductions to cover mitigation costs? There has been a recommendation by the Green Budget Coalition for a number of years now, um, uh, which the National Radon Program has, has been supportive of, but at this point in time, I'm not aware of any tax mitigations um, that are gonna, or tax, uh, income tax reductions that are gonna be offered for mitigation. We are also working to um, encourage and support action um, to make radon mitigation more accessible to people because we do recognize that's the biggest cost of this whole process. And unless and, and until you do take that step, if you have high radon levels, you're not really reducing your risk. So we're hoping to see um, more programs available, but right at this point in time, there's no federal programs. Okay, thank you. And last question for Carrie. Carrie, where do you get your courage from? Mm. Oh, I think you might be muted there, Carrie. Yeah. Uh, that's a, I mean, I have a, an extraordinary family and friends and community around me that has been absolutely awesome. I get asked a lot um, and told I'm so strong and that kind of thing. But I mean, when you're going through this process, you, it's kind of like you're on a conveyor belt and you just, you have to just keep going and um, the strength comes from, somewhere it comes from me being a mom and worrying about my kids and wanting to be healthy and strong as I can for them and so yeah you just you do whatever you can and and I want them to be healthy and safe and I want their kids to be healthy and safe and all my family um and friends and community I want every I don't want anybody to go through what I went through so that is how I am encouraged Thank you. Thank you both. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we have for this evening. Thank you for both for sharing your presentation and for the wonderful answers you provided to uh, our many great questions tonight. And, and you know, I really want to thank you guys both for, for your courage, um, Carrie, for, for mm. sharing your story and, and Kelly for sharing your expertise. Um, and, and, you know, I hope that this has really encouraged everyone to take action on radon. 
you know, especially as we spend more time than ever at home, now is really the time uh, to test. And we hope that you'll visit myradonstory.ca uh, to test your home for radon. You can purchase a test kit there from the Lung Association. You can share your radon story, or you can certainly give the gift of lung health prevention and purchase a test kit for your friends and family. And if your radon levels are high, uh, remember that there are radon reduction experts certified by the Canadian National Radon Proficiency Program that can help you reduce your radon levels in a very safe and effective way. And to find a certified radon reduction expert in your area, visit cnrpp.ca. And in Saskatchewan specifically, we are fortunate enough to have Connexus Credit Union as a proud sponsor and partner to provide additional support through our Caring Breasts program. And the Lung Association of Saskatchewan's Caring Breasts Financial Assistant Program includes radon mitigation reimbursement applications for Saskatchewan residents. So to learn more, visit lungsask.ca. And a recording of tonight's webinar along with the translated French slide deck provided by Health Canada will be available on the Lung Association's website, myradonstory.ca. So please also consider uh, not only testing for radon, but donating to your local Lung Association as well to help the good people in your province breathe a little bit easier. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.